Sports Live is presented by Seneca Resorts and Casinos. Nothing else comes close. We are going to overtime! Sabres Live overtime definitely required in the first preseason game this year. Welcome in. When you're serious about the game, bet on Buffalo at the only sports books in Western New York. Seneca Resorts and Casinos betting counters are open daily and self-service betting kiosks are available 24-7 at all three locations, whether you visit Seneca, Niagara, uh, Allegheny, or Buffalo Creek, the Sports Lounge features the latest lines and multiple screens so you never miss a play. The sports book at Seneca Resorts and Casinos, where the love of the game meets the thrill of the win, Marty Baron. And that's exactly what Buffalo was able to capture in the first preseason game against the Caps. Two wins, Duffer. You should say two <laughs> wins in one game because they did win the game in overtime and then they won the practice shootout that was going to happen hate, regardless. Which is why I didn't oh, bring I it up. I absolutely hate it. Hate it. Like, Don't play start the on a shoot- bad note. Just embrace the victories. I know. Well, I, I'm going to say that. I, I'm a positive guy this morning. I said the Sabres won two times in one game. <laughs> I, I didn't bring up that I hate a shootout, a meaningless shootout in preseason, but... It was actually um, I didn't I didn't mind it in this way because I think the Sabres have a lot of younger players that you want to see. Hey, how is this going to work? Like if it's Stock and Thompson and Skinner and and mm-hmm. those guys, middle stat and whatever, you're like, okay, why are we doing a shootout in preseason? But when it's younger guys, it's UPL. Okay, I want to see what's happening there. So uh, yeah, it was all good, all good for me in the first preseason game. Let's just since you brought it up, let's focus on the age, and I will quiz you. What do you think the average age of the forward group was on Sunday? Well, without um, looking, come on, spontaneous answers. I'm going to say 24, 22 average age of the singular goaltender who played yesterday. Uh, 23, 23 average age of the defense core yesterday. 24, four. 22, 23, and 24, the combined positional ages. That's about as young as you can possibly get in an NHL preseason. This is not prospects challenge anymore. Especially this was an incredibly young group, especially if you were looking at it top six wise, which is where I know you want to dive in. First of all, here on Sabres Live Overtime wow. because of the trio of Quinn cousins and Paterka. And I have to say like there's rules in the NHL preseason that you have to dress a certain amount of veterans. So when your veterans are younger, it adds, you know, it helps lower the age and that's what the Sabres have. They have a lot of young veterans, which makes that, uh, you know, the average age was low. Yes. Let's focus on that top line that the Sabres had going on in the first preseason game. I was all excited about Quinn, a right-handed shot playing the left wing. As we talked about a lot this summer, he likes playing his offside. Paterka, a left-handed shot playing the right wing, same thing, playing the off wing, and Dylan Cousins in the middle of the ice. Now, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, where is Dylan Cousins going to play this year? Is he going to play in the middle? He was good on the wing at the World Championship. There's a lot of a lot of players that can play center this year when you have Thompson, Middlestat, Cousins, Krebs, uh, you know, there's a ton of them, right? I thought they did a fantastic job as a trio, all in their own position on the power play together. There was chemistry. Um, I think this is very telling, and I know it's the first preseason game, but it's very telling of what the Sabres are thinking and the fact that Dylan Cousins is um, – a, like a center. And I'm not saying that may change. That may not change. It, it may change as it goes, but Don Granado, Kevin Adams really like Dylan cousins. We really like Dylan cousins. We just want to see more production, mm-hmm. but he's still a young man. Let's not forget that production will come and production came in that first game and having Quinn play the left, Paterka play the right, put him on the first line in the first preseason games. That's also knowing like, Hey, they're going to get opportunities to make this club, to showcase what they can do. And uh, for me, that was very telling. Sabres scored four goals on Sunday, five on four, five on five, six on four, and three on three. The first tally by Cousins was a power play goal. Buffalo went two for four with the extra man on the day. Cousins' goal was set up by Paterka and Pilot. So that covers two-thirds of the forward group. <clears throat> and obviously, 
Lawrence Pilot, in his first game back with the Sabres, made an impact as well. More on that momentarily. I do want to mention, though, since you brought up that line, Quinn and Cousins are actually the same age, both yeah. 21 years old at the moment. And Quinn, beyond the offensive contribution, which was a really impressive six on four goal at the, you know, in the 58th minute, yes, no, it 59th was... minute of the game, because it wouldn't if it would be the 60th minute if you're in the final minute of the game yes right, you're right because the first minute of the game is at uh, 20 like uh, until 19 let, let me months. let me ease the confusion quinn's goal uh was at 1855 but as don granado pointed out the the best part about buffalo's six on four goal was the fact that they had every reason to be a little bit frustrated before it happened they were afforded a power play thanks to the efforts of Vinny Hinestroza and a net yep. drive with about two and a half minutes to go. The first 30 seconds didn't go well. Then they time out. Then they pulled the goalie. And then they still had issues. Another lost faceoff, a poor play overall that pushed them back out into the neutral zone. But they stuck with it. And Quinn, who had been denied earlier, delivers with what the coach said was an incredibly clutch type of play yes. which is what they think of him as now i will say this quinn also had and i hope that this is video session material for the group a really strong defensive play in the second period five minutes to go they were in the offensive zone paterka <laughs> fell and it caused an odd man rush the other way and when you watched it closely at about center ice quinn realized exactly what he had to do even though there were two defense back and sure enough, he ended up being the primary guy in the slot that negated a pass across that would have been an easy, beautiful Washington goal. So it's the old adage, right? Like the good defense is going to lead you down the road yes. to better offensive chances. <laughs> Cousins, of course, drew a penalty in this game, won the only face off of overtime and uh, was one of two Sabres with a two point game. The other being Lawrence Pilot who is topic number two for you. Yeah, so Lawrence Pilot, and I have to also just point out that on the six on four and on the power play goal by Dylan Cousins, like you had Paterka on the right flank, you had Quinn on the left flank. So both of those guys are comfortable quarterbacking like or controlling the power play from either side. It gives the penalty killers a bit of a, a harder time when it's not set up on one side and you know what you're going to do. So that happened at the five on four goal by Dylan cousins that also happened on the six on four goal because you had Quinn coming in off the left flank to come in for a rebound or a second opportunity. That's how the goal happened. Lawrence pilot. Uh, yes, he had a great feed to Hennis Rosa on the three on three overtime, a lot of confidence, almost too much confidence that Peyton Krabs didn't know what to do. He's like, wait, wait, I'm supposed to have the puck. I'm Peyton Krabs. I'm the he, playmaker. You know but what Lawrence, he was there? He was the co-pilot. He was the, yeah, good one. I like <laughs> they, it. They were so close together. I'm like, what are they doing? <laughs> yeah, they were occupying the same space. It's like, get, get away from one another. There's plenty of room out there. But Pilot played with a lot of confidence. He was on the power play. He was a power play uh, point man on that first unit with Quinn, Paterka, Cousins, and Brett Murray in front of the net. Uh, you could tell that Lawrence Pilot, obviously, having gone to the KHL, play pro, he feels better about his, his, uh, his ability, his self assuredness his confidence, and you saw it with the puck and without the puck as well. So, you know, a lot of people yesterday uh, were really, really high on Lawrence Pilot after mm -hmm. the game, rightfully so. Does that mean that Pilot is like, oh, well, he's making the Sabres this year? I still think he's a dead piece, but it's great to see that he's come back with a really, really good attitude, a fresh mindset, wanted to be here, wanted to make the team, wanted to push the, uh, uh, you know, the pace and training camp here. So I thought that was a really, really good uh, showing by Lawrence Pilot. Led the team with 22 and a half minutes of time on ice. Also was on for three of Buffalo's four goals. They went two for four on the power play in the game, which is huge. However, the 50% success rate with the extra man was negated by 50% on the PK as they gave up one of two. But you will take yeah. those odds every time. And I dare say, Marty, this is the type of disparity you want moving forward. Four power plays for your guys, two against which speaks to 
good positioning in your own zone because you're not chasing it and making an awful lot of, you know, poor decisions. But also, I thought Buffalo could have been, and it's easy to say because we're really fixated on certain guys. They could have drawn more power play opportunities. I mean, welcome to the NHL, Yuri Kulik, as he took his first high stick. A lot of blood and no call, of course, right? So that was, you know, one of these learning moments for all these guys. And I thought his game stayed pretty true after that. Now, Pilot and was it was kind there. of funny too because out of one penalty, the one to Riley Sheehan, they yes. get a, a two on one that led to tie um, to Coast Ice and Cossack's goal, right? And yep. if you're watching the uh, the broadcast, uh, the Washington Capitals broadcaster are like, "That's a jailbreak. You get out of the penalty box and you get on a break and you score. Great jailbreak by Riley Sheehan there." So again, like. I felt like the Sabres were the faster of the two teams. Yes. And early in the in the game, Zach Fucali, the goaltender for Washington, really saved a lot of really glorious opportunities that the Sabres did not convert on. So you talk about driving the, the play, the mm-hmm. pace of the play, drawing penalties. That was all part of what we wanted to see in the speed of the game. And uh, they all did a really good job at that. Yeah, that uh, Shea-in out-of-the-box moment that led to the Kozak goal led to Buffalo's only lead of the game prior to winning in overtime, and it lasted 26 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> so the Capitals had a very quick response, but there was so much to love about shea It was eight seconds, him being out of the box, and number eight ends up with the primary assist on Kozak's ultra confident goal. So let's lead into the youth up front and start with Kozak before we get to Kulik and Savoy. Okay. Well, we, we've seen uh, Tyson Kozak on the, uh, during the prospect challenge and we all loved him. Right. And we, uh, not the we love he's at five goals now in his last uh, four well, games. It's, it's not just the goals. It's the, the leadership, the, the way he plays the game, the, um, uh, the willing to sacrifice himself and he'll do that a lot blocking shots and getting in position what i like most about that goal is that players that come out of juniors have skills right like you you're a good junior players you're a good you know european players you played at the world juniors whatnot like you have mm-hmm. skills but can you execute the skill at the speed that the NHL wants you to execute at? Now it's preseason, so it's not the same level. But when Riley Sheehan gave the puck to Tyson Kozak, it's on his backhand. It's not like in the wheelhouse. He's not a lefty coming in, tapping the stick. Boom, it's on his stick and it's released. He has to pick it up on his backhand across the body, bring it back and release it without having anybody get in the way. Like the quickness of it was was on display. And I thought that was the most impressive part. The shot was really something like it went bar down over the right shoulder of the goalie, but yeah. the, the execution of picking it up on the back end to the forehand, that really impressed me. He has shown us Kozak has very many different ways that he is capable of scoring. And again, this yes. is the trajectory almost unlike any prospect that we're talking about right now, because most of the time we talk about high end picks and the seventh round label is never going to escape him. It's only going to add value to his story. I thought it was really interesting to see when the lines were put out in the pregame warmup that it was a Murray, Kozak, Shane combination. Yes. And, and not Shane in the middle. I was surprised about that because and, we talked like Riley Shan could come in and be like a fourth line center if right. they have to find. But Shan was on the right wing. It was Tyson Kosak that was in the middle of the ice. And you don't know whether that trio has the potential to be together in Rochester, but it's possible, yeah. certainly, right? If Shane doesn't make it, and he knows this is reality, he was very honest upon re-signing with Buffalo, that look, if I have to go to Rochester, there will be no ego. It will be left behind. I will do what is necessary. So yeah. the fact that you then put him with an established AHL player already in Brett Murray, who continues to try and ascend and actually was really good yesterday, along with Kozak, who's getting his first taste of it. I loved how the trio played. But Kulik is someone who draws more attention because of his first round selection this year. Yes. What did you make of him as the coaching staff continues to try to give him as much comfort as possible as he was playing with Rusek, his checkmate, and of course, Peyton Krebs? Yeah, so Krebs in the middle. You So you put some... Uh... I don't want to call it veteran leadership because Peyton Krebs is still a young man, but you're going to put Rusek and Kulik with somebody that has played both at the AHL level, at the NHL level, that's going to be able to give them a little bit more skills on that line. Yep. Um, 
I, see, this is what I think of Kulik. Yuri Kulik is going to be a really, really, really high-end prospect. You see it in the way that he plays the game, the, the little uh, details in his game. And I think the best part of, of showing or maybe painting that picture for everybody it was a chance by Dylan Cousins in the first period where it was a hard shot from the point. It was kind of a, a slap pass from the point, but it was a hard one. Oh, yeah. And Kulik stopped it really hard and made a backhand pass to Cousins across for Kelly, the goalie for Washington, make the save. But when I saw Kulik handle that pass, mm -hmm. which was a slap shot, essentially, handle it and quickly in one motion go back into Cousins behind the back, I was like, whoa, that is a high-end skill play. So mm -hmm. will it take a longer time for Kulik to be comfortable making those plays all the time? I think so. Like, he's he's a higher-end prospect, but he's not an NHL prospect right now. So it'll be interesting to see how he develops in Rochester. But those type of plays make you, like, go, like uh, – you know, Roger Rabbit, like your eyes come out of your, 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 your skull, like, rrr, rrr, like, wow, that was pretty special. Good modern day cinematic reference there. Um, as far as, as the, the, the kids know who Roger Rabbit. Yeah, is. I know. Do they know, I know who frame Roger Rabbit. Really? Do they? I don't know. I don't even, I've seen the movie. I don't even know who framed him. <laughs> it's so long ago. No one can remember. Uh, Matt Savoy, take us through his day. Okay. So Savoy. Um, so I'm going to say this a little bit more quiet. He had a good chance on a rebound shot from Fitzgerald came in on a yeah. rush. Savoy oh, came oh, off yeah, really the good. bench, I believe had a really good chance. Yes. Uh, another good save by Ficali, right? Another really good save. That was uh, late in the first period. I think there was like four minutes left. Yeah. Um, so again, I think that what we're seeing out of Savoy is there's these flashes. There's flashes of speed. There's flashes of, of chances. Uh, you can now tell the difference between guys that have played at the NHL level, guys that have played and have success at the AHL level, and guys that are prospect that play juniors and are hoping to take that next step. Savoy is hoping to take that next step. Maybe in game two of the preseason, game three of the preseason, whenever he plays again, you see a little bit more. You're seeing some flashes. It's just not coming all together. I look on great tool to have during the season, but even in preseason natural stat trick, right at five yeah. on five, Matt Savoy was on the ice for six shot attempts mm -hmm. at, on the ice and nine against that's yeah. not a lot created, right? Like right. you look at, you know, but it's Dylan also Cousins. not terrible either in the sense of like, it's not like their line was getting crushed, right? It's not like they were getting crushed, but they only got, he was only on the ice for six shot attempts at five on five. Mm -hmm. Second low, well, actually tied for lowest on the team with Rasmus Asplund, right? So I'd like to see more offense, more shots on goal. Maybe, you know, you got shots blocked or missed and that those are shot attempts, but I'd like to see more of that. But I don't want to just focus on the, on the, on the numbers because I still think that the speed is there. The hockey sense is there. It's going to take a little bit of time. There was a steady progression throughout the game. He had a third period look, which was not a scoring chance, but ended up hitting the post. Would have put Buffalo up 3-2 yes. for Savoy just two and a half minutes into period number three. And again, we saw his goal scoring touch kick in at the end of the prospects challenge. And when you're playing with Asplund and Henestroza, you're also probably learning a little bit of the finer details of how to defend <laughs> as well. And you're right. I mean, I think between the three of them, they certainly had some excellent chances. Now, um, and again, it's of... just again to show you the difference. Like Asplund's number in the game were yeah. the same thing, like six uh, sh uh, shot attempts, four, nine against. But Asplund is going to do it in a different way. As right. an NHL player now, you could see that. Well, I don't really care about the shot attempts so much with Asplund. I want to see mm. other part of his game. Hannah Strosa, you could tell, like, this is a guy that plays NHL, right? Yeah. And yeah. he finds himself in certain areas especially in preseason that he stands out and he stood out in this game. Uh, I'll try to empty the notebook before we end this uh, Sabres live overtime podcast, but I know you want to touch on Uko Pekalukinen and his full 61 minutes and 15 seconds and seven round shootout. 
Yeah, so that was another thing that was very telling to me is that, okay, the Sabres are giving UPL a full game. At first, I thought, well, he'll play a half. Malcolm Subban will play a half. Uh, the Sabres are going to probably give Comrie a full game when he goes in, probably Craig sure. Anderson a full game. They may be the only three goalies that are going to play NHL action in preseason uh, mm -hmm. because they started with full games right away. Uh, I thought UPL, once again, showed his strength. His strength is lateral movement, down low, around the net. Um, I, I felt like that was a good game for UPL. Not out of this world. Uh, you know, there was a couple of situations. Again, a long-range deflection shot that ended up being the 3-2 goal by Washington. You yeah. know, it's, it's a tough deflection. It's a screen deflection and all of it. But with his size... And his, his height, especially, I want him to be able to locate those and see those. But I felt like that was a good first step for UPL uh, in the way that he played in this game. Yeah, that go-ahead goal is crazy. It was, it was <laughs> face-offs were not kind to the Buffalo no, throughout the course not. of the game. But more on that in a second. But it it, it was like they, they got crushed in the defensive zone and neutral zone with face-offs. And this one started outside the blue line lost the draw, quick dump in, two guys unable to retrieve the loose puck slash win the battle. Then it's point, shot, tip, score. And you're like, holy cow, that happened quick. There wasn't that even like, really there, was, there was no sustained zone time. There was no imminent danger being presented by the Capitals, but it just happened, right? So what's good about it is, as much as we said the Sabres only led for 26 seconds, they also trailed twice in this game mm -hmm. and found their way back to level. So that was because of a six on four goal at the end. Uh, they had one six on four goal last year over the course of regular season play. Um, now they've got one in the preseason and Uko Pekka Lukanen emerges with the victory in a day where the shots were pretty low 28 yeah. 27 Buffalo. The shot attempts were slightly in Buffalo's favor 52 49, I believe. Um, the, Duffer, the can I ask you a question? Yeah. Because that was on top of my sheet. What did you think of the digital ads on the boards during the game? Did you notice, Didn't notice them? them? Did not notice them one. Did not notice them. So no. it was very I was fixated white. On, yeah. It's funny. And then you, you would that. have those have, digital. Yeah digital ads that would appear, right? So mm -hmm. it would rotate. It's not like the old, just a sticker on the boards. I, I would think that in in house, they probably had stickers on the boards for the fans, but on right. TV, you had the digital ads that would switch and change as the play was going. I Did actually any of them chase the players? No, nobody chased the player. Nobody joined the rush. Nobody was a net front presence uh, <laughs> as we've seen before. But I actually felt like in the the... It was funny because if you went like right now, we're, we're seeing a replay. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see the actual ads on the boards, right? The ads that right. are in the building, but when it's the main camera during the play, you, it's not the, the, uh, the, the actual ads It's digital boards that are flashing and rotating through the game. So I thought it was pretty cool. I thought it added a different uh, thing that we're going to experience with this year in the NHL. Uh, also, yeah, definitely good to point out. Now, as far as um, Lucan and I thought he looked, and and you've referenced it off the top. You you take it for what it's worth because in the <laughs> within the confines of an exhibition game, to have an exhibition element on top of it, which was the unnecessary shootout. Um, there have been times where Lucan and has struggled a little bit in the American League in the shootout. Yeah. Um, other than, you know, the one goal allowed, and that was uh, Snipley, I believe, uh, who also had a tip-in goal in the third period and might be one player to watch for the Capitals as they try to have guys fill in for veterans who are out due to injury. Um, I thought the way Don Granado described Lukanen without over evaluating because he was very cautious not to over evaluate anyone on night one yes he felt that lukanen looked very well conditioned and that's important especially with the poise that he showed in the shootout because marty my guess is that when you've won a game you've already got the happiness of oh. winning in overtime there has to be a tiny 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 
mental element that says, eh, whatever, right? Even but, though you're ultra competitive. Anyway, he gives up a goal. They answer right back. Paterka gets it. And then the shootout goes on and on. And I thought he looked really, really good. Yeah. And maybe that's a good thing because I'll say this, a lot of goalies in a regular season setting, you get to the shootout and you get tense, you get tight, you give up the first goal, you lose your rhythm and all of a sudden you lose the game and it's over. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what just happened in 35 seconds, we went from starting the shootout to ending the shootout and it's over. Um, right. I, I've, I've lived it. I know exactly what that's like, but <laughs> when you, Maybe this having this opportunity for for Uko Pekka Lukanen to get a win in overtime and then have this, oh, okay, let's do a shootout. Let's relax. Let's have mm. fun with it. Let's uh, have that approach to the shootout if it happens this year. Because shootout points are big points. Mm -hmm. right? Like you could get seven, eight, nine points extra in a season by winning shootouts. And if you do so, you can go from 85 to 94 very mm -hmm. easily by having those type of wins. And we've seen yeah. it around the NHL. Some teams, oh, I don't remember who it was like three or four years ago. They basically did not make the playoffs because Dallas. Their shoot Dallas, you're right, Dallas, their shootout were so terrible that they missed. And then they the reversed it last year. They were very good beyond regulation last year. Um, yeah, it's, I, I was just really happy for Lukanen that, and through it all, a lot of things ended up working out his way. And, and that's, man, we will never stop talking about it. Like just, yeah, there's, there's always going to be bad moments in the game and not him specifically. There's just going to be bad team moments. And, um, I, I, you know, I described the three, two capitals goal. There was an earlier one that, um, you know, in the second period, the, yeah, the, the Connor Sherry one, which was a, <clears throat> an amazing pass from Protus. Yeah. But like, that was a neutral zone play. Savoy lost the handle. And as Savoy lost the handle, Clegg thought he would make up the difference to try to get the guy. But then as he went to get the guy, Savoy was flat footed. So now the guy that might've been Clegg's guy, but is now Savoy's guy was able to spring free. And again, like it all happens within four seconds. And it wasn't like some catastrophic turnover. But anyway, these moments are going to happen. But again, I didn't think there was much, there was much Lucanen moments. could do on the play. It was a wonderful feed from Protoss and a really nice finish by Sherry on that two-on-one. And this is a really good teaching moment for a lot of players. But I'll go back to UPL again when I say it's a good showing for UPL. But one of the things that I've talked about and how UPL plays the game is mm -hmm. he often ends up falling forward. He's big. He's strong. He moves laterally really well. But... He has to build that core strength and core control to not <laughs> fall forward on right. those type of launching plays, right? You're, mm -hmm. And that pass goes to his left, his glove side. He should just push, keep his shoulders up, reach, and try to keep your body. He fell forward. Connor Sherry knew exactly what to do. He got the puck. All he needed to do was elevate it. But yes. I think this is a good teaching moment. There was really good moments for UPL in the game. Then it's like, okay, let's keep working at this. Let's do drills that you're going to come across and come across with your shoulders back yeah. as opposed to be flat, flat on your face. Okay. So since you brought it up, do you notice that he's more upright when he goes from his left to his right than his right to his left? Because there were moments in the game, I thought one save yes. in particular, but he slammed the right goal post a number the of post times, twice. meaning, meaning full body yes. upright. And he <clears throat> robbed McMichael on what I thought was going to be an easy goal for the Capitals. So yeah, that I was at one, one in the second, like he was all right off the, the left side of the net, the right side of UPL and you're right. UPL pushed with his left leg, but I think yeah. that also could be like back in the days, right. As a young kid, all I wanted to do in the basement was glove saves. Like, oh, yeah. You would shoot glove save. So my left hip opened up really, really good, and my body turned this way. If I tried to do it to the right side, I was like, eh, can't do it because I overdid a certain move, and as a kid, that mm -hmm. locked up one side. So that could be also a difference in UPL is just an adjustment. But I think when I – the way you talk about it, and then I think to myself – 
I almost feel like it's a, a, a lower body strength. Like a lot of goaltenders, even though they're right-handed, will be stronger on their left legs. Mm -hmm. So UPL pushing to his right with his left leg seems to me like he's more explosive this way than going from his right to left pushing with his right leg. And that save on McMichael was exactly that. Like it was such a strong push that if mm -hmm. the net wasn't in the rubber pegs, he yeah. would have ended up in the corner with the <laughs> yeah. net because he almost <laughs> moved it out of its place. Capitals have the edge in high danger chances, 11-7, according to Natural Statric. Um, now, let's, uh, oh, one last thing that I wanted to mention, and we're late for time here, I apologize, just trying to cram as much in as possible before <laughs> game two of the preseason, which is Tuesday night at KeyBank Center against Philadelphia. And we'll be live at the arena for Sabres Live on Tuesday. Yes. When thinking of pilot, and he played with Fitzgerald, do you think Buffalo will keep both of them, meaning eight defensemen? And those two would be seven, eight on the roster. And the only reason I ask this is I don't believe Fitzgerald would clear waivers. Uh, so if they want to keep Fitzgerald, is it better? Because you have no cap concerns. Is it better to keep two defensemen to give them better practice habits on a daily basis, or does that not matter at all? Okay, well, so Paul Hamilton reported on Monday morning that the pairs at practice were Samuelson, Dalene, Power, Yokiaru, Bryson, Labushkin, which is what we thought it was going to be when we first did the depth chart of the Sabres. That's, this is your top six. Now, who stays for seven, number one, is it Fitzgerald? Is it Pilot? Or if you can sneak Fitzgerald through waivers at the end of training camp when there's an influx of waivers, players that are on waivers, would you like to have Pilot and Fitzgerald as your top pair in Rochester and play a lot of minutes? And then as soon as there's a need for somebody to get called up, you have those two available because they're playing a ton. That's the big question right now. I don't personally see the Sabres keeping eight defensemen because that only allows you to keep one extra forward, right? To your 23 man well, roster. Why would you need more than one extra forward? Well, again, there's some waiver concerns with some of the forwards. There's no and waiver concerns. Come on. Who? Uh, Who? Tell me. Okay. I'm going to pull up my depth chart again. From... Please do. This okay. is the unexpected portion of Sabres live overtime folks. So yes, absolutely. So if you have the lineup that I had first thought about, mm -hmm. which is includes both Paterka and Quinn, right? Mm -hmm. That leaves you with Henestrosa, mm -hmm. Bjork, yeah. um, obviously Savoy, but Savoy can go back to juniors. Shane was the Shane only other one. Shane is the other one. So that leaves you with three guys mm -hmm. that would be left off. I would think they would want to go with two extra forwards and one extra D to start the season. That's just normally what teams let, would do. Let me rephrase it. Who would be the worst guy to lose? Pilot, Fitzgerald, Sheehan, or Bjork? I don't think you lose Pilot. I think that he's not far from people's mind, but I You're think not Pilot, answering the question, though. No, no, the, I'm going the through question the process. Is who's, we're I'm going through the time. process. Come on. <laughs> okay, I'll say Bjork is the one you don't really care of losing, but I don't no, no, think no, you... no, 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 no. You're looking at the wrong way. Who do you not want to oh, lose? Oh, who do I not like, want who, to lose? What would be the worst one to lose? Between that? Pilot, Fitzgerald, Bjork, and Shan. I'm going to say Casey Fitzgerald. Right. Which is why I don't think he's going to go on waivers because I don't think they would then, risk losing him either. Yeah, but then you keep 7D. I think one of Pilot or Fitzgerald's guys has to go to Rochester and play. Okay. Like you don't that was my keep... original question was whether you would yeah. keep seven, eight. Yeah. Yeah. I would think you keep seven D because you don't want both of them to just be practicing. We got an answer. Thank you. That was tough. Sorry. I had a late night duffer. Sorry. I know. Congratulations on that. That might tie in with your three stars of the week, which starts now. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, I, uh, man, three stars of the week. Oh, um, Jeez, or up the the weekend. Make it saber related. Keep it on point. Okay, because tomorrow on Tuesday, I have a special um, re well, request. I got to bring up something that happened over the weekend. But 
three stars of the weekend. Uh, oh, this is so tough because I didn't even think about it. I'm going to You want say, me to start? Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to think about it. Okay. So my three stars, uh, brief mention earlier and a little bit more of a mention. They played on the same line, and I'm doing two for each star slot here. Tyson Kozak and Brett Murray. Brett's yes. net front presence was exceptional yesterday. Uh, I thought he did everything asked. And combined with Kozak, holy cow, there was a time where Davies ended up drawing a penalty. But the only reason that he was afforded the opportunity to come down low and draw the penalty was an exceptional shift from the Kozak line that led to the onslaught, if you will. So full credit to the younger members of that line in Kozak and Murray for making an absolute impression in my eyes. Now, funny enough, Davies on that play where he drew the penalty ended up trying the lacrosse move <laughs> and it didn't work, but Prisky and Davies. So we're, we're talking about a defense score yesterday that was Pilot Fitzgerald, Davies, Prisky, Sova, and Clegg. Again, yes. average age 24. I don't know if you know how much pride I take when watching the game without statistical accompaniment, only to have everything validated by the statistics after when you look at them for the first time. I thought Prisky and Davies were very solid yesterday. Prisky led the group with a 69% Corsi rating, and Davies was second with a 64. So I'm tipping the cap to them because the eye test told me I really liked what I saw. And let's not forget, when Buffalo called the timeout, they went out six on four with Cousins, Quinn, yeah. Pilot, Paterka, Murray, and Prisky. Prisky at the point. And Chase Prisky wins the opening face-off battle in overtime. Yes. We joke all the time. What's the strategy at overtime? Win the draw. Mm -hmm. Cousins put it in an area. Prisky had to win the race to get the puck right at his blue line. If he doesn't, who knows what happens? Yes. But the fact of the matter is the coach started with Asplund and he started with Prisky. And I think that's a real feather in their map. Uh, no, along yeah. with Dylan Cousins. So it was Aspen Cousins and Prisky to start the overtime. Yes. And by the way, Aspen got an off ice assist on that game winner. Didn't even get a plus, but the goal was Hinnestrosa from Pilot and Aspen as Rasmus was on the bench for it. Oh. Anyway, Davies and Prisky are star number two for me. And star number one, Marty, happened at the arena on Saturday night. Johnny and Robbie. Yes. And the Goo Goo Dolls who had not played the arena since 2003. Now I consider myself a pretty big fan, but admittedly life has gone a little sideways in the last five years. And uh, for a lot of us, um, I somehow, I mean, they've been so consistent in releasing albums, but they snuck in a little EP in 2017. It was a five songer that I was unaware of. So I kind of felt bad about that. And after blowing the roof off the place with the finale of Iris before coming back for an encore, they came back with a song from this EP called Tattered Edge slash You Should Be Happy. Now, I don't want to oversimplify it because it's a very real world song. Um, so the lyrics that I will choose to reiterate here are, are going to sound oversimplistic and not do justice to the entirety of the song. But it was strange for me to be sitting there at a Goo Goo Dolls show that I love, and they were great, and not know the first encore song. So that was an odd phenomenon. Wow. But the song ended, and then they let in. Then they went into Tom Petty's, um, you know, "Run Down a Dream," and uh, which in itself was amazing. But the last words of "Tattered Edge," "You Should Be Happy," are all we need is something real to believe in. And I think that ties in nicely with what we've seen from this group of Sabres and hopefully in the bigger picture of life too. 
No, that's awesome. I saw a lot of people heading out to that concert Saturday night, so I was interested to see how it all turned out. I believe I was in the arena when they played the last time at the arena in 2003. They also um, played the first concert when the arena was brand new in 1996. So, so when they played in 2003, were they opening for Bon Jovi that year? That I don't know. I Because I remember going to... I was more excited about the Goo Goo Dolls that I was about Bon Jovi back then, mm. but I remembered them opening for Bon Jovi and going to their concert one year. So that was great. Okay, here's my three stars. Um, we talked a lot about hockey, the Sabres, so I'm going to go in a different way. Third star, I'm going to give it to all the Bills fans that traveled down to South Florida and taken over the elbow room. Duffer, you and I know very much what the elbow room's about, right in Fort Lauderdale. Allegedly. On the A1A. Allegedly, we all know what it is um but it was fantastic to see a group of fans traveling supporting you know we talked about the road crew party this year in raleigh north carolina we get the same feeling with sabers fans and i hope that the sabers fans are going to travel this year support their team and in the next few years because the team is going to have that same buzz so congratulations to bills mafia traveled in numbers it was great to see it. I know the game didn't turn out the way that everybody wanted to. My second star, this is a weird star because I feel like the Bills didn't execute all that well, but one, one guy went viral after that game, and that's uh, offensive coordinator Ken Dorsey about after he had his rant on the uh, in the coach's thing or whatever, and he called himself, he says, I hope I'm not a psychopath like earlier in the – but – some fans pointed out to me, and thank you fans on Twitter for doing so, that Ken Dorsey uses the same four-color pens that I use during my notes taking. So second start to you, Ken Dorsey, for using the blue, green, black, and red pens to take your notes, right? So out of this rant, there's all the highlighters, and there's the four-color pens right there. So second star for Ken Dorsey using the pen. And first star, um, this is a proud moment because we traveled to Canada yesterday. My son played in his first CCHL game. They won the game 4-3. So congratulations to Jacob. But more importantly, uh, I had the easy trip. I drove five hours there yesterday morning, drove five hours back last night. His mom and sisters traveled from New Hampshire, Manchester, New Hampshire yesterday morning seven and a half hours to Ontario Smiths Falls, where the game was. They had to go through Burlington, Vermont, Montreal, down Cornwall, up to Smiths Falls. And then we had to get the whole crew home because they had school this morning. So they traveled seven and a half hours to the game, five hours back to Buffalo, got in at 1, 1 2 o'clock in the morning. And uh, just so they could support their brother. So I thought that was great. So congratulations to Jacob. And we're happy that uh, the whole family was there to see it. Absolutely. Congratulations and to that's all why of I have the no runs. voice today because it was kind of a crazy ending. That's amazing. Perfect way to cap it on Sabres live overtime. We'll be live from Key Bank Center on Tuesday. We'll see you then.